rose up to be an astronaut. Not everyone was born to be a king. Not everyone can be Freddie Mercury. But everyone can raise a glass and sing. Oh, I haven't always been a perfect person. I haven't done what mom and dad had dreamed. But on the day I die, they'll say, at least I bloody tried. And that's the only eulogy I need. Yes, that's the only eulogy I need. Good morning, everybody. It is good to have you all here on this fine morning. <laughs> Stop giggling. They're already laughing at me for uh, I'm Reverend Hank Purse. I am your interim pastor. It is so lovely to have you all here on this glorious, glorious day. There are a bunch of things happening today. I am glad you are here. And I also, I want to just call out for a moment and embarrass a friend of mine, the Reverend Paul Sawyer and his wife Katie are here from uh, Vermont. Um, they're down doing a wedding. Um, and they've, I don't know who you've left doing your services up there at Four Corners in Vermont. Who cares? It doesn't matter. You're here, and we're happy to have the two of you here. It is really a, a, a true blessing to have you guys with us today. And with that, I'm going to turn the service over to Elise. Welcome to First Parish in Milton. My name is Elise Henricks, and I'm a member of the worship committee. Uh, First Parish is a vibrant, welcoming congregation that welcomes all people to grow deep faith and take bold action. We're so glad you're here with us today. This sanctuary is made holy by your presence. If you're joining us for the first time, please take a welcome packet from the pew rack in front of you. There's information about our services and our child care. If you filled out the yellow card inside the packet and drop it into the offering plate, you'll receive our weekly email newsletter, which can get, help us to get to know you better and get you to know us better. Um, we have a fellow greeter here, Brigitte Miller, who's in the back, and she can meet with you after church if you're new and show you around the place and walk you over to social hour. We strive to make our worship experience accessible to people of all ages and abilities. Please see the welcome card in your pew for more information on this, or speak to Brigitte or one of our friendly ushers in the back, who's the rest of my family. <laughs> uh, the work of our living our faith is done both in and out of worship. So I draw your attention to the printed announcements that came with your order of worship. These announcements are important news of our community life, so please read them carefully. There's a couple of things to draw your attention to. First of all, um, membership committee invites you to drop by the First Parish Milton booth at Celebrate Milton today at the Pierce Middle School from noon to four. Also, Kiki and the office remind us that next week um, there's going to be some paving going on in the, in the area behind, the parking area behind the office, and so there will be no parking there next week, so you'll have to find other areas to park over here for church. And thirdly, the youth group needs a second adult for their meeting from 12 to 1 p.m. So if you're able to help out with that, it would be much appreciated. And you can see Hank or um, the youth group after church. Thanks. Oh, one more. Oh, one more. So, sorry, I have one more announcement. Next week is the animal blessing. And um, uh, so we invite you to bring uh, a well-behaved animal um, uh, or a a photograph of your animal, uh, uh, and, and in that case, we don't really care how behaved it is, if it's just a photograph, um, and, um, uh, or a stuffed animal, and, and like a teddy bear, not like taxidermy, right? So that's, so that's it. You can bring those. All right, there you go. And last of all, and most importantly of all, I want to tell you that you belong here. You belong here maybe just for the next hour, though we hope for longer. You belong here, and we're happy to have you with us. Extending a generous welcome is a spiritual practice, and right now I invite us all to extend that welcome to our neighbors by taking a few minutes to greet them warmly. Okay, um, please join us in singing our first hymn, number 23, Bring Many Names.
Our chalice lighting words today come from Paul Stefan Dodenhoff. Joy and grief, health and sickness, light and darkness, peace and anger, life and death, wholeness and brokenness. We each bring all of these here to this sanctuary of unity and diversity for this one hour of this one day and pour them out, commingling the oil of our lives to become the flame of this chalice, the symbol of our shared faith. Please join me in our call to worship. Come, let us gather. We gather to celebrate the sacred within and among us. We come to seek spiritual growth and understanding. We strive to practice acceptance, forgiveness, and love. Together, we work to build a world with justice and compassion. Come, let us gather together. A reading is from Ralph Waldo Emerson's farewell sermon. In the history of the church, no subject has been more fruitful of controversy than the Lord's Supper. There never has been any unanimity in the understanding of its nature, nor any uniformity in the mode of celebrating it. Without considering the frivolous questions which have been lately debated as to the posture in which one should partake of it, whether mixed or unmixed wine should be served, whether leavened or unleavened bread should be broken, the questions have been settled differently in every church. Who should be admitted to the feast and how often it should be prepared? In the Catholic Church, infants were at one time permitted and then forbidden to partake. And since the ninth century, the laity received the bread only, the cup being reserved to the priesthood. But more important controversies have arisen respecting its nature. The famous question of the real presence was the main controversy between the Church of England and the Church of Rome. The doctrine of the consubstantiation taught by Luther was denied by Calvin. In the Church of England, some archbishops maintained that the elements were in a Eucharist or sacrifice of thanksgiving to God. Others, that this was not a sacrifice, but a sacrificial feast. And one bishop stated that it was neither a sacrifice nor a feast after sacrifice, but a simple commemoration. And finally, it is now near 200 years since the Society of Quakers denied the authority of their right altogether and gave good reasons for disusing it.
I want to uh, take a moment and just draw your attention to the um, uh, to the announcements again uh, for a, uh, a whole different uh, reason. Um, uh, I want to make sure that, that you're, everyone feels invited to come down to the Celebrate Milton uh, event. And if you look in the in your insert, you'll see a picture of a fortune cookie with a little like a really cool quote on it, right? And um, uh, and we've actually had these fortune cookies made. And they have like they've got a cool quote on it and the church's name and stuff. And so I'm telling you all this one because I'm sure many of you many of you will be coming down to the celebrate Milton. And I want to um, instruct you: they're not for you. <laughs> They're not for you to take, they're for people, visitors to take. <laughs> if there are any left, we'll bring them next Sunday for coffee hour, okay? I, I, I want you to know that right now. I love you, I want you to have snacks. <laughs> okay, you get the idea, all right. <laughs> Ralph Waldo Emerson left his church and his ministry because he did not believe that the Lord's Supper should continue to be celebrated. Or at least, this was the excuse that he used um, to leave the ministry of uh, what was the second church in Boston. Even though they themselves said, no, no, it's okay. You can, you'll stay, we won't do communion. We'll have someone else come in and do communion. He was like, no, 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 I'm, I'm set on it. And he left. I don't doubt that he believed this ritual was not consistent with the original intentions of Jesus. However, I think that he had many questions about his ministry and used this one as the tool of his exit. He did still influence the next generation of Unitarian ministers who began calling into question many of the rituals and beliefs of the church. Theodore Parker, the great Theodore Parker, scandalized the Protestant faithful by stating that he believed that what was central to Christianity were not the rituals, were not the rites, and that not even Christ was central to what was true at the center of Christianity. What was there were the teachings that inspire and the spirit of God which renews in our lives. I share that story with you. I share all of this with you on this World Communion Day. A day when people who follow the teachings of Jesus around the world remember what it is that binds us together rather than what divides us. Because that still happens. Communion is still used as a weapon in many places. In some places, you need to have a little token, a little coin that you would show that would prove that you were uh, of good standing to take communion. This is also one of the, the four uh, times in the year when our Unitarian brothers and sisters in Transylvania um, take communion. This is, um, uh, and, and, and thus I wear my, my Transylvanian uh, stole made by the Unitarians uh, in Transylvania. This is one of the four times of the year when they take communion. Now, I grew up as a Unitarian Universalist in a church that was heavily influenced by the free thought of the Transcendentalists and by the Quakers. Being down in, in fact, the, the church I grew up in, which was uh, um, historically the first parish in Dartmouth, uh, which then became the first Unitarian church in New Bedford, it was in fact, it was placed down there uh, to, as, as a way to try to stop the growing Quaker uh, uh, wave that was going on in the, in the late 16th, uh, late 17th, early 18th century. Um, and at one point in the uh, uh, early 19th century, the Quakers had a revival uh, um, a movement that swept through it. And it was, it was a, 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 a revival that said that people were getting too liberal. And, and, and they, they started throwing people out of their meetings for, 
for doing things like paying for a band to march in a parade or for um, uh, or, or because uh, someone's uh, wife was seen wearing ribbons in her hair and they said that's too fancy and you're thrown out of uh, out of the meeting and then everyone came over to the Unitarian Church in New Bedford they went they'll let us pay for bands they'll let us wear ribbons they'll let us do a lot more other things as well but the Quakers as well as the Salvation Army don't practice communion in their worship services. They believe it is not meant, it was not a ritual meant to be perpetuated. Um, n n uh, neither was it uh, should be mandated. I asked the historian of my home church there in New Bedford, uh, when was the last time they celebrated communion at that church? And he said it was probably around 1860. <laughs> When, when Reverend William Potter um, decided to stop uh, holding communion. Beginning in the 1820s, people who had come over from the Quakers would walk out before the communion service took part. Ralph Waldo Emerson, who was sort of a summer minister there one year, wrote about seeing his aunt, Mary Roach, walk out. And the Reverend William Potter, who I spoke about, who grew up Quaker, asked the congregation if he could just stop doing the communion uh, as soon as he got there. And there was no resistance to ending the practice. All this is a way for me to say, I never took communion as a child or as a young adult. In fact, the first time I ever took communion was when I was serving communion in my internship at the United First Parish Church in Quincy, next door. And um, it was, re you know what, it was, it was a really strange feeling. First of all, since I was holding one of the silver uh, uh, um, chalices, I had to wear these white gloves. Their silver, uh, which is now has all been sold, but their silver, like the, the 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 our finest silver that we have here in this church, it was all at the uh, 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 at the MFA at the, at the Museum of Fine Arts, and they had to have a um, a guard come over. So there was a guard uh, seated out uh, out in front uh, of the church, just hanging out there, waiting for us to be done with our little ritual, so they could bring the the chalice back uh, to the to the museum. But it was strange for me, not only because it was guarded silver, and I had to wear these white gloves, um, but because I was, it was strange for me to, to finally take part in this ritual that my childhood friends talked about having such strange mystical powers. And at times they talked about the dread that they had to, to, to prepare to take their first communion, all the things they had to do. And there I was, just kind of willy-nilly up there taking communion, sharing it with everybody. But over the years, I've come to really enjoy and celebrate, and truly celebrate, the communion service for many reasons. Many of the same reasons, actually, that Parker and Emerson might have rejected taking communion. And that is the freedom of conscience. I get to make a choice about what I want to celebrate, what rituals I want to take part in. And this is one of them that I have really grown to love. There's an old hymn, not that we sing, that, not that we sing it in this church, um, but you'll hear it sometimes at, at other uh, uh, churches, mostly Protestant churches, and the, the hymn is called, Were You There When They Crucified My Lord? It's an old hymn, but not so old that as you expect someone to say, yes, yes, I was there when they crucified my Lord. <laughs> the hymn asks that question because through the gospel stories, the hymns, the rituals of the church, and our own personal experiences of loss and struggle, we have a chance to understand, maybe not intellectually, but emotionally, what it must have been like as a follower of Jesus when Jesus was crucified. The ritual of communion, the Lord's Supper, is one of those events where we are brought together. During the communion, our linear concept of time collapses. It is one of the few times when we feel that we too are partaking, are partaking in a ritual of remembrance of something that although we know happened a long time ago, we experience it as if it happened just a few years ago. Maybe just before we were born, 
or maybe before you came to this church. And you may even feel that if you asked around enough, you might just find somebody who does remember Jesus and his friends and remembers that last meal that he had with his disciples and may even remember the horror and fear and failure that came afterwards. Today, we experience a shared event of the communion. Here, we are bound together by an experience that reaches across race and class, across families, across time, to a place where we are made into a new family. Some of you, uh, in one of my uh, services this summer, some of you heard me tell the story of attending a, uh, a memorial service for uh, a young woman who had, uh, was friends with many of the, the members of the church, the first church I served uh, in Auburn, Maine, the first Universalist church. And, uh, and although she was not a member of our church, I went. She was friends with many of the people there. And uh, it was a service conducted by a Roman Catholic priest, and he came in and he led the service. And at the end of the service, he closed his book and he crossed himself. And all of these people that, that, I'm, that I was sitting with, all these people who were members of the church that I served, they too crossed themselves. And at one point, at that, at that, in the split second, there's a part of, in the back of my head, a voice that said, we're not supposed to do that. I, I'll, have to, I'll have to teach them that we don't do those things. <laughs> And then, luckily, there was another little voice in my head that went, Shut up! <laughs> this is these people realizing that they are part of the larger body of, of faith. That they are joining with their loved one whom they have lost by taking part in this simple ritual. So just shut up. I'm glad I did. Today we will share a ritual that reminds us of the Last Supper. A meal that reminds us all of our humble beginnings and of a God who unites us and brought us not only out of slavery but into glory. Now the worship theme for this month is faith. And today's sermon is called The Variety of Faith. Because I know that each and every one of you have different beliefs and opinions about what it is you believe about God, about the holy, about the sacred, and about this ritual. You all have different beliefs. Even if you say you don't, you do. See, and here's the truth. Most people and, and all the churches that you will ever attend have different beliefs, have a little bit different beliefs than the person they're sitting next to. But we are one of the few religions that say who acknowledge that fact that we do all have different beliefs. That we, all, that we do all have a different understanding of the sacred, of the holy, of the rites and rituals of faith. For some of you who perhaps grew up Roman Catholic, the teaching that the bread and the, the wine transform into the actual body and blood of Jesus has perhaps kept you away. While for others, the idea, uh, the belief that the real presence of Jesus is a part of the elements that we share is, is comforting to you. Perhaps if you grew up in uh, a Jewish tradition, you look at this and you say, this is like a, uh, the, like, a, 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 like a Cliff Notes version of the Passover Seder. And you would be right. In many ways it is. For some of you, it is an act of remembrance. Remembrance of this great teacher whose death was an injustice. For others, it may only be a snack to keep your blood sugar levels up. <laughs> Let's be honest. And yet, we come here to share. The communion is about belonging. It is about celebrating. It is about caring and making peace. It is about giving thanks for new life. It is about going forth to make a better world. It is also about making that act of conscience to decide to partake or not to partake. And knowing that whatever your choice, whatever choice you make, that you are welcome here. That you are home here in this church community. Like the numerous cups and plates that belong to this church. I, I, I made sure, I, let me say, I 
covered every inch of this church looking for cups and communion plates that belong here. Now, we have this wonderful set of, of silver that's at, as I said, at the MFA. And, and I have photographs of them up there, here on the table. Do you see them there? Now you know, what I'm, what, now you know what I, why I have all this stuff up there, don't you? And we've got um, cups, some with juice, some with wine. We also have the, 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 the small cups that you find in many of the, the sort of the low church Protestant uh, services, sometimes in Methodist, sometimes in Baptist, sometimes in the Universalist churches, those small communion cups, which I always sort of liked uh, because it was a sense of like you're, that you're, you're, you're serving yourself, you know. But they're all there. They're all there. And the same way that all of them are different, all of you are different as well. Our beliefs can be very different from each other, and yet we are still invited to join together to share this simple meal. We commune together because we live at a time and in a world that wants to isolate us, that wants to keep us apart from each other to make us feel weak, to make us want to buy the things which then connect us to each other. So, this ritual, this communion, this common meal, this act is a radical rejection of that isolation that our society wants us to be in. It is a coming together. This is a chance for us to say that this church is dedicated to the proposition that behind all of our differences and beneath all of our diversity, there is a unity which makes us one and binds us forever together. When I look at this table here before you, with all the different plates, it reminds me of that scene in the film Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Remember that scene? That was the, that was the, 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 the movie where Indiana Jones was looking not for the Ark of the Covenant. That was the first movie. This, he's looking for the, um, uh, um, the, the Holy Grail. The cup that supposedly Jesus used at that Last Supper. And Indiana Jones reaches this temple, this, this, like, this, this like cave, and this, there's this ancient knight sitting there all covered in dust. And he gets there just at the same time as the bad guy gets there. And there are all these cups and plates there, all these things, all these, all, all these different things, and they're all filled with wine. And the knight says to the two of them, choose well. And the bad guy looks and he realizes one of these cups is the Holy Grail. One of these cups is the cup that we're supposed to take. What will give me eternal life? And he looks around and he picks out the biggest, gaudiest looking hunk of gold and jewels. And he takes it and he drinks from it and he dies. And then Indiana Jones realizes that Jesus was, would not have used some giant golden cup. He would have used something very simple and he picks up a small wooden chalice and drinks from it. Or actually, I think even before he drinks from it, he picks it up though. And the knight says, he chose poorly, you chose well. Our cups are filled with juice and wine. There is no poison. <laughs> Whatever cup that you choose, is the right cup. The power, of course, is not in the cup or in the elements, in the bread or the grape juice or in the wine or even in the act. But like most of life, it is in the power that we give to it. Amen. Would you please join me in singing our second hymn? It's number 407. We'll sing while we're sitting down. Number 407, going to sit at the welcome table. 407. I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Here's the 
Here is the fruit of the vine, pressed and poured out for us. Let all who thirst now come forward and drink. We come to break bread. We come to drink the fruit of the vine. We come to make peace. May we never praise God with our mouths while denying in our hearts or by our a- acts the love that is our common speech. I come to be restored with the love of God. I come to be a new and instrument of that love. I know that I am worthy. I know that I am welcome. All are worthy. All are welcome. Come into the embrace and remembrance of this communion. Amen. I see. I, it's nice having the, the, the kids in the children's chapel. I can actually see them coming through the window. Well, not, I mean, they're not coming through the window, but I can see them through the window coming over here. That's what I mean. <sighs> if you're visiting us for the first time, it's not always as, as wacky as this, honest. <laughs> I'm telling you that. That may not be true, but I'm telling you that. This is not your father's communion service. It is a a service of commemoration, consecration, and fellowship, open to all who desire to take part in it. There is no bar to belief, faith, or age. There is both fermented wine, which will be served on the left-hand side, and there's unfermented uh, grape juice uh, to be served on the right-hand side, or, sorry, your left, my right, sorry. I'm serving the grape juice. <laughs> At least I'm serving the, the wine. Can I ask uh, the other folks who are taking part uh, in our service to come forward? And let me also uh, invite you uh, also to know that um, there is also a gluten-free alternative here in the middle, uh, and you have um, uh, gluten-free crackers and also gluten-free juice um, that you can take part and use. Our communion today is quite different, a quite different celebration than the Lord's Supper of the 17th century in this church. Our doors are open wide. Our table is wide. Take part. Stay. Witness. Sit if you wish. Come forward, even if you don't wish for a blessing. We practice in this church, we practice intinction, which is a very fancy way of saying dipping. I'm going to invite you all in a few moments after, uh, after we have said, our, uh, s- said the words. I'm going to invite you all to stand. Oops. And if you're in the center aisles, to come down the center aisles. And then take part and then circle back around. If you're in the, the, the side aisles, so I'm going to ask you to go out to the back and then come around that way. It, just, it, it, it looks better for the camera, if anything else. This meal of bread and wine comes to us from ancient tradition. On the night before he died, Jesus gathered around him his community of loved ones, those who would carry on the work of peace and justice in his name. He spoke of a God who wants to save the world and who needs human help to do it. He spoke of how hard the work of justice can be and the joy that comes from it. He spoke of the way the work must be done in a community of love stronger than death. The bread would be broken as his body would be broken and die. The wine pressed from grapes would be shed as his blood would be shed. Those who joined in the meal knew its significance. They understood the difficult work of sacrificing for love the paradox of the lonely path to an ultimate unity with creation. They learn the power of community to heal and overcome the peace of those who remember that love. The meal of bread and wine is the communion in this love Jesus taught and that we share in remembrance. We share it remembering our own religious ancestors who gave their lives for freedom of worship and freedom of thought. We share it holding in mind all of those who, around the world, 
are today being persecuted for following their beliefs and for being who they are. We share it remembering that though we may think and act differently, we belong to each other. We share it remembering that true power lies in the depth and breadth of our love. This is a communion with all those who are led by the power of love to acts of compassion, of mercy, and of justice. It invites us to gather the courage to make the realm of the sacred visible among us. As we confront the powers that would divide us, that have divided us, in every time and place, we know too that we have often fallen short of living the power of our love, of justice, and of mercy. We gather at this table of radical welcome that brings us together, whoever we are, whatever we have done, in the promise that we can and will be one. We invite you all to celebrate this teachings of Jesus and the tradition of this church. Friends, in faith and love, we invite you to enter this communion. As Jesus supped with his disciples, he took the bread and broke it. Can I, can I give it to you? Thanks. And said, take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup and gave it to them and saying, drink this, all of you, for this is the symbol of the new covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Holy mystery, death-defying love, bless this bread and this wine for our use this morning. May it remind us of all that we are called to do and the dwelling place of the sacred within each of us. Bless these grains and this fruit. Let them nourish our spirits for the work of the living in this world according to a holy purpose. Amen. We will offer you the bread of life and the cup of hope. If you have mobility issues at the end, please uh, let us know and we will come and serve them to you. We offer you, you these good gifts for the hunger of the spirit. You are invited to come forward. By this communion, we enter into gladness that the spirit, with the spirit of the sacred, known by many names, is within us, around us, and among us. She has appointed you to bring glad tidings to the poor, proclaim liberty to the captives, unity to a broken world, and to beat swords into plowshares. He has called you to the dance of connection with all beings and with all the earth. So may the loving God bless you, work beside you, challenge and comfort you. In the name of God, who is our parent, our sibling, our strength, and in the spirit of Jesus and the many prophets, we say amen. We hold up in our prayers also this week, Lynn Stack's friend Lisa, who is no longer with us. And for India, who is asking for wisdom gathered for, a, for, family, for family issues. And God, we think of all those around the world this day who are struggling for justice and for peace. We ask your blessings on them and for all who seek to be together. Let us be in silence for a few moments. If you are proud of this church, become an advocate. If you are concerned for its future, share its message. If its values resonate deep within you, give it a measure of your devotion. This church cannot survive without your, your confidence, your enthusiasm. It, it's destiny, the larger hope, rests in your hands. The honor of God be given and received.
Ended, let us depart in peace. Remember the words that we have said and the act that we have done. The work of the world lies before us. Accomplish justice with grace. Our worship is over. Our service begins. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.